So, for now, for another minute, is and getting everyone signed up. And um, if you guys want to come for part of it or all of it, or on the table, we have such a fabulous lineup of classes, all the We're really trying to meet everyone where they're at. You know, that want to Hi, everybody. Such a big crowd on Zoom today. Hi, Carrie. Yay. And um, Dana, is that is that Dana's mom? Is that, I see Finn. Is that Barbara? Hi, Nadine. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Jen. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Gail. Hi, Katie. Hi, Hi, Hi Rhonda. Is that Rhonda or Jeff? I see the winners are. So quick recap, especially we have Lisa and Heidi that are here for the first time. And you missed last week also. So, so okay, so we're really in a very exciting, a very exciting teaching right now, okay? And I'm going through the teachings of Rabbi Niven, who's a, a really incredible, find in Israel, he's been developing this curriculum for the last 20 years. And it's to help people find their, what's the word? Yi'ut, okay? Their unique soul's mission, okay? And, um, and this is already week three, I think, that we're doing this. And today we're gonna delve into some new material on personality traits that will just add another layer to helping us figure ourselves out and the people around us. Okay, so a quick recap. So we are deep into the month of Elul, which is known as International Deep Thinking Month, because this is the time that the energy is all right for us to change, to grow, introspection, reflection. What did we do this year? And what are we showing up on the upcoming high holidays to ask for a new year. Like what did we do and what do we wanna do? So this is the time to kind of come up with a game plan. So when I think about, hi, when I think about a game plan, I'm a Canadian girl, okay? And there's no other fellow Canadians here. I feel very, very alone over here. But, and do you guys hear my accent? Yes. So you, you pick it up sometimes. Okay, so I say A once in a while, but I, I hardly say it anymore because everyone's like, you are Canadian. So, I, you know, if you see it, if you hear it, great, keep it to yourself. But I'll tell you, one of my experiences as a Canadian was we had Canadian Boxing Day was a really, really big deal. Okay, so I know that you have Boxing Day here, you have President's Day, they have all the sales over here. It's not such a big deal in America, but in Canada, it was like we waited for this once a year big sale like everything went on sale like you know 70 percent off clearance and I, I i loved that day there was no school right it was right after right after christmas so when i think yeah it was like right after christmas and it was always like you, you just you, you get ready like as a teenager who didn't have like you know unlimited access like i would save up cash from babysitting jobs and so i had my wad of cash I knew what sales were happening. I knew where that dress was on the back of the rack where I put it because I knew when they opened that store, I'm going to be the first one and I'm going to get that gorgeous dress from Holt Renfrew. Do you guys know what Holt Renfrew is? Is that so Canadian? A very expensive store that I loved. I wanted that dress in my closet, okay? But I had like very limited funds. So I had years where I was ready with gas in the car night before and I went to sleep early and I was the first one as they opened the door and I got that dress right I I when I'm driven when I want something I will get it but you know, when, you know the night before boxing day all my friends came over and we ended up watching movies till three in the morning and um I woke up and I, I couldn't remember like like what I'm on insufficient funds in my debit card like that was like a regular occurrence in my life still is <laughs> some things never change and um and I just blew it so by the time I got to the store I walked out with what like nothing no bag 
and I just did some window shopping. You know, big signs on the store that they have aisles, but you have to put it there and there's everybody. And it's just over here, very a personal shopper, right? You know what I mean? You know when you like you want that size, that thing, you know. I'm still thinking about the dress with the buttons that you said you're gonna get me. Remember? It had a rip in it, and I'm like, why did you do it? No. <laughs> I didn't think about it. I didn't forget about it. Okay, so that's so that's an analogy for this time of year, okay? Because Literally, we are either going to walk away from this month that has potential to change our entire year and our destiny, because one year could change the next year, right? We have that possibility of coming out of this experience with shopping bags full of merchandise, or we can do what we usually do, what most people usually do, which is just like window shop. Oh, it's a nice idea. Okay, well, some apple and honey, go back to our lives and not really come out with, with something concrete. Okay, does everyone, everyone understands this. If you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. fail, okay? So without having a blueprint, you can't really build anything. You can't build a building. You can't even build a hut without having a little bit of a plan. So all of this work is part of the planning so that we know that we could come before God in a couple days and say, this is who I am. I've cracked the code. I, I'm feeling more connected to my essence, to who I am. And what we're gonna hopefully get to today is the power of teshuva. So does anyone know, we, uh, many of you, That's a ball tissue. That's on that return. Okay. And this whole time of year is about returning. So the question is, why are you returning? So most of us don't even know because we're not with who we really are. So most of us are returning to God. But we're not returning our soul to our creator. We're not, we want to stay down here. We want life, right? So we're not really returning in that way. That is one way of returning. When your soul goes up to Shamayim at the end of your life, that is a full return. Right now, we're returning to who we actually are, our essence. So that's why this work is so important. What is our essence? And that is the hardest question to answer, Okay. So let's let's go. So uh, some of the words, some of the things we've been speaking about over the last two weeks. One, as Sue said, yiud is the Hebrew word for our destination. Because if we don't have a destination, we're not going anywhere. We, we have no direction. So yiud is our soul's destination. What is our soul's mission? That was one word. The duality of that is figuring out what our tikkun is, our fixing, our rectifying, our challenge, okay? So we have purpose and challenge. All of us have it. We need to figure both of them out, okay? Then I asked you guys to think about like a moment that kind of speaks to you where you were very much in your zone of being in, in your purpose. And then the question, the, that billionaire question of what would you do if you had all the time and all the money in the world, right? Those are some ways of figuring it out. Then we spoke about why God does not give us our purpose so clearly. Why we are not born with, as I said last week, a tag coming out of our tuchus that says, this is what your purpose is, okay? And we spoke about the reasons for that, right? And you guys had great answers. One, we want to self-actualize. We want to do it ourselves. We're like that two-year-old, me do it, okay? We want to do it. If someone tells us to do it, all of a sudden, it takes away some of our desire to do it. That's just human nature. 
And another reason is it's all about the journey. It's not about the final destination, even though we're, we're, we're looking for a destination so we could get, but we're about that dash, the dash in the middle of when we were born and when we die. We're all about that journey. That's where the work is, okay? And the journey, by the way, that dash, I know it's just, you look so pretty today, Zebra. By the way, you're wearing makeup. I know, it's like crazy. Brightening. What? <laughs> you said brightening. I know, you look so nice. Thank you. So so um, that dash, which is a nice, short, straight line, right, is actually not supposed to be straight. And think about, is it called an EKG? Like that test on the heart? Right. And, and when it's straight, that's not a good thing. Right. We, we want it to be, 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 we don't, right. Unless the machine is broken, but we want it to be up and down because that means we're still alive. So it's going to be full of challenges. And that's, that's that duality. Like we, <laughs> okay. So, so let's actually go into the next, to the next part of this. Sue, you said tombstone and that, that brought something to mind. Okay, so so legacy. Legacy is another big word that we have to think about, okay? Because a great question to ask ourselves during this time of year is that tombstone. What do we want written on our tombstone, right? That is an exercise. What do you want written on it? And I'll tell you, one of, one of the powerful things that I do when I teach women more class and And you know what I'm talking about. So what I find so amazing is that when you walk around in that cemetery, you don't need a guide. You don't need to say a word. And as you walk by the stones, you're basically reading the stories of people's lives. You could tell so much about what their special thing was, what their info was. Like you have the, the tombstones with the, the, you know, the fingers, right? the Kohanim, like you know, my family is from that tribe, fingers like that, because that's how they did their mm -hmm. Stop, stop. To you to the dochening at my house. Remember that with my father, right? My father's a Kohen. So that, so, so I'm seeing who, what, what tribes they come from, from the the pictures that are engraved onto the stones. I'm seeing women with, um, with candlesticks, right? I'm seeing um, charity boxes. Must uh, this was their essence? Their essence was they were the. There were some candles that were that means that they died before their time, meaning they, they were very young and their life was was their their flame was snuffed out. I mean there's you literally are walking around reading the stories of people's lives and then Tells a whole story of people's life. So, so that's another question in figuring out what we want our legacy to be. What words do we want written on our tombstone? It sounds a little bit morbid, but moving into the the idea of Musser, this movement of of Musser of change. Hundreds of years ago, the great Musser giants that wrote all the the books that we have that we're studying till today, they would do some pretty severe things. They would, I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, this seems a little like eerie, but sometimes they would dig a grave and lie in it just to feel invincible. Is, is that the word, invincible? Invincible means, okay, so, so the opposite, meaning they would dig a grave to sit in it, to feel vulnerable, to feel that, because that, because when we're alive, sometimes we feel like we have all the time in the world, right? But to sit in a quiet grave at night, it's, it's pretty eerie. 
pretty creepy. <laughs> what are you saying? What are you saying, Sue? Creepy and eerie and all that. But what are they? What are they doing to themselves? They're 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 getting their egos out of the way that they were born from, from ashes, from like, from the dust. I mean, man was molded from the dust of the earth, first man, and man is going to go back to the dust of the earth. We only have that dash, right? It's so short. Like we're not, none of us are going to live forever, right? None of us, the only way out is to end up in that grave. So it was an exercise in reminding them, don't get so full of yourself. What is it all about? So talking about legacy, I just want to mention last week, I went to get one of my children um, uniform. And I, I don't know Chicago very well. My, my kids go to school. All of them are in um, West Rogers Park, Peterson Park. One is in Lincolnwood, right? They're, they're in schools over there. And there's another community that was, it's a little separate and it, for sure, you know, Beverly, but it was, it's the, where the old Ari Crown used to be. What's it called? They said like, well, I went to school there. What, what's it? So what's it called? It's Albany Park. Albany Park. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I was like, where am I? I really thought I was in the middle of like <laughs> Borough Park right. because it's a little enclave of, of ultra, ultra Orthodox Jews yeah. with a, a yeshiva, tells yeshiva is still there. It's been there for 60 years. And I think the Jewish community mainly moved away. That's that's what I got from it. It's, yeah, it's just a little, it's right across the street from a university campus. Right, right. North Park. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, I drove there. I'm like, give me an address, put it into my GPS. By the way, GPS in, if you want to make a parallel, I always think GPS is, is the God positioning system, which is what we have inside of us. What's our God positioning system? Our soul, our soul, right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. Like what is, what is driving us? Like what, how do we find our, our so that, so I put in my technical, my real GPS in my car and I get to Albany park and I'm like, where am I? <laughs> Literally in the middle of a regular secular community, there's this like bubble of Orthodox Jews. So I'm buying the uniforms and I'm asking questions because I'm so curious always. And yeah, so it's probably like a couple hundred people that live in this few block radius centered around a yeshiva. So me being me, I'm very curious. I drove around. I, I love, I love Jews and I love communities and I love learning. So I'm driving around and I see this massive building right across from the university. And on it, it says the Joseph Tenenbaum building. Now I grew up in Toronto and our synagogue was called the Bayit. Okay, Bayit means a house. And when I was a young girl and we started at the synagogue, it was actually a house. It was very, very small. And then this man, this, this, this angel, this special guy, secular Jewish man, no, no keep on his head, no big long beard, very, very tall, contributed millions of dollars and built by it into the largest Orthodox synagogue in North America. And that's where I spent my childhood being raised in this modern Orthodox community. So here I am in Chicago and I see Joseph Tenenbaum. I'm like, what is his connection to Chicago? So I snap a picture of it. I put it on my family chat and my father starts, you know, my father, if you guys met my dad, he's like a real special soul. And he's telling me the stories of Joseph Tenenbaum and how when he goes up to Shemayim, he is going to be greeted by like, you know, angels and angels. And I mean, God himself is going to usher him into the highest levels. And then on our family chat, so we're, we're in Israel, we're in Canada, we're all over the place. My brother in Israel chimes in and he says, right down the street from his house, there's a building, the Joseph Tenenbaum Synagogue. And I just had chills. Like his reach is so far. I thought as a kid, it was only in his little place in Toronto because Chesed starts at home. But his love for the Jewish people had no bounds. That is called a legacy. And that was the conversation on our chat all about legacy like what a legacy this simple man has greater than than the greatest rabbi he he made so much happen so much judaism happen in all corners of the world we don't even know how far it reached we just know that in all of our communities we've been impacted by that so that's legacy yes but i actually think they got that building i think they bought that building also 
So there are many, many buildings there in this whole, there's about 200 Joseph Tenenbaum. It's unbelievable. You should come out and Google him. He was, he was, he was, he was he just loved the Jewish people. He was a Jew. And um, he is, if he's still alive, he must be in his late 90s. Um, I remember him as, like when I was younger, I remember him as just like a really simple person, like so unassuming, like you would, but but he he, he did um, make a huge impact. So that's that's legacy. And that's something that we need to think about. Like if we're trying to figure, like what will our legacy be? Yes. But isn't it true that they say, I know he has not saved lives, but brought the Jewish community in an unbelievable way. Isn't there an old, you're saying if you save one Jewish mm. life or oh, yes. one Jew, you're in that category just by virtue of one. Yes. I'm just yes. Asking. Yes, that's that's so true and so beautiful. That's that's written in the Talmud, and it's also everyone knows it from Schindler's list, right? If you guys saw that's what he engraved on that ring that they gave Schindler, Oscar Schindler. It says if it, if you save one life, you have saved the entire world. So for all of us, we all have a different mission. So some of us are not blessed with the millions and billions of dollars that Joseph Tenenbaum was blessed with. He took his gift and his talent and his passion and his love. That's what we're talking about, right? Last week, we, we made a Venn diagram. Uh, one circle is your talents. One circle that overlaps is your love, what you love doing. And one circle is your paradise moment where you know you're in the zone. And I did this actually with Angie last week. She, she, I, I didn't figure out her life. She figured out her life, but it was actually so amazing. She sent me a little, her diagram. And I looked at it and it's so amazing to see like when something clicks, her love, her passion, her talents, all of that overlapped in giving to others, in teaching others, in being a lifelong learner, it was so clear because in that little middle place where the three intersect, that is your purpose. So when it's so clear, it was so clear. I mean, she wrote it and I just put it into words. I basically wrote her her elevator pitch, her life's mission in two sentences. And I said, is this you? Because it's not me. Like I can't tell someone what their mission is. It has to be them, but I can help tweak it. So I sent it back to Angie and she's like, you got it. You got me. Right. And it's such a blessing to be able, first of all, to be understood by someone else. Like, I feel like I understand her more and, and I, I respect her more actually, because now it's like very clear to me who this person is in front of me. And I hope you also like grew a few inches because you're like, I'm a person that wants to do good for the world. Everything from, from her, like, so interesting. Um, can I share a little bit? Her paradise moment was connected to the adoption of her child. And her talents and her love had to do with giving and compassion. It all came together, every part of it, teaching others, learning, all of that was so connected that it was so clear. I mean, you were easy. You were an easy one to do. But, um, oh, yeah, we love it that you're here also. So, so there is a quote, I think this is um, Pirkei Avon that says, Im ein anili mili. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, if 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 it's not, if I'm not going to do it, who's going to do it for me? Which is very much what we're doing here. No one could do this for you. This is the work that you need to do because only you have the answers inside you. You know what you need to do deep down, and no one could tell you because once again, self actualization. If someone tells you, you might not do it. Okay. So it goes on to say, Im ein anili mili. if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? Okay, and then it goes on to say, Im ein anili mili. And, if I'm only and if I'm only for myself, then what am I? If you're totally self-absorbed, you're not making an impact on the world, right? And then it says, the im lo achshav, achshav, the im lo achshav ematai. And if not now, then when? And it's so powerful. It has to be you. And you has to extend outwards. If it stops with you, you've missed the whole purpose. And if not now, when? Because we don't have so much time. We have that dash and we don't know how long that dash is going to be. 
So Elul, Rosh Hashanah, next, next week, literally in a week and a half, our fate will be determined for the coming year. So it's a really big time to be asking these questions. Now we're gonna go into the next part. Are you guys ready to move on to new material? <laughs> we spent half the time, okay. So now we're gonna go into personality, okay? And this will just add another layer. It's so much fun. Okay, raise your hand if you've done this before. This is, you've done it with Lori. Okay, so Dana, you might have to help me out here, okay? I might call on you a bit. Did anyone else ever hear this class? Never heard it? Like on none of your trips did Lori get, like on my last, on the trip that I led in July, she actually came and taught this class. But like on the May trip, you didn't hear it. So, okay, so hopefully new material and I'm just gonna do a little bit of it, but maybe I'll send a link to the entire class if anyone wants to hear more. No, no, no. This is, oh, that's another fun way. Okay. On, at the Soul Sister Retreat, we did something called Dressing Your Truth, which was so much fun, I right? You left, left confused? I could have been in every group. Really? Okay. Well, I, I mean, I had a lot of fun with it. So that's what's, that was what, what was it's important. <laughs> um, and, and it seemed like people were, I mean, you, you got a lot out of it, I could tell, right? It's just very, it's validating. It's validating when you get it. Just like Angie, when when I did when we did the your yud last week, it was yeah. validating for you. Right. It was nothing new. By the way, we don't go to fortune readers, right, as Jews, because we don't want to limit ourselves. But but there's nothing wrong with getting your handwriting analyzed, right? right. So there is this rabbi. His name is Tom Meyer. He lives in Israel. I'm sure. Have, you, have any of you guys on on the trips, Laura? You know, because you know, like on the trip, you get this paper that says if you want to get your handwriting analyzed for like a hundred dollars or whatever. So I did it with him because every trip they're always saying, okay, I'm like, what's the big fuss? Like, let me do it. So he didn't tell me anything new about myself, but boy, was he able to read me. And, you know, and, and actually like, he was like, you're so loyal. He's like, if anyone wants, if you're ever applying for a job, tell them to call me. Yeah. Meaning like he saw that I'll, I'm all in. Like he saw like, I'm someone that like, you know, I'm there. So, so it was very, it was nothing new, but it was, confirming and that's also very good because sometimes we're like I don't know unsure of ourselves okay mm -hmm. so he actually has a book it's out of print right now but I'm going to try to get it I think we should have it here it's called power um, powers of the soul by this rabbi Tom Meyer who does handwriting analysis but he also speaks about personality type so I'm just going to jump in we're going to divide we're going to divide us all into three parts three things three names three identities and we all have part of all three, the same as dressing your truth. We have a little bit of all, but there's gonna be one primary and one secondary, okay? And I want you guys to kind of be like, bing, 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 that's me, 100%. So it's called Chayim Bracha Tov, okay? What does Chayim mean? Chayim. Oh, I have Carrie. Carrie is on the, um, Carrie, you were there in July. I, I don't see your, your face. Yes, right yes, okay, hold on. So Okay. <laughs> so Kiri, yes, you can chime in. You can chime in if you remember any of these details. Okay, so do. Chayim Bracha Tov. Chayim means life. Bracha means blessing. blessing. And Tov means good. Okay, very simple. Chayim Bracha Tov. Chayim are thinkers. Bracha are doers. And Tov, sorry, sorry, I miss, mix, mix, mix that up. Bracha are feelers and tov are doers. Okay, so now we're going to go through each one. So chayim, the thinkers. Okay, so now there is our soul and our body. Okay, so both are, are very different in how we experience things. Okay, so if you're taking notes, you might want to say chayim soul and chayim body and how it manifests. Okay, it's a little different. So I'll give you some examples. So the Chaim soul is the, the typical scientist, the thinker, the critical thinking, smart chess playing, um, debate teams, almost like the absent-minded professor, okay? He's, his head is in speeches and ideas and you know, just all the smart stuff, his or her, okay? Now, someone like this, we were just talking about, you know, you said your niece, 
is so smart. And we were talking about my son. And I said it about my son. Yeah, we want to, we're making a shadok over here. But um, I, we said that I, I, I shared that my son is so smart, but he's like, he doesn't work hard. Like if he would actually like, you know, put in a little effort, he'd, he'd be so brilliant, but he just coasts. He coasts. He will, he will hopefully. But Chaim souls usually do, don't do so well at school because they're so smart and school is not set up for smartness. School is set up for memorizing stuff and, and spitting it back. So they they get very bored. That's not how to utilize their, their brilliance, okay? So they actually, a lot of them might come across, you know, not so smart or struggling in school. They struggle because school is not set up for chayims, okay? So chayims are people that are thinkers, absent-minded, um, you know, they're not into spitting things back. They're into real information, science. They need to see it. They need to feel it. Okay. That's the soul. Now, high bodies, they pick up vibes, which is actually very good and very bad. There's always a flip side to everything. So they make great therapists because they feel you. But feeling could also be very painful because you absorb all the energy in a room. So Chaya bodies tend to be introverts because they can't be around so many people's energies because they don't know how not to take it all in, okay? So it's like, it's, it, it could be very dangerous and they tend to just like to be by themselves because they don't want to pick up all the energy, okay? So could anyone think of a Chayim in your life? Someone that, as Lori, Lori jokes, she says her and her husband, her husband is a Chayim. I think he's a double client, actually, even very brainy. We're going to meet Bobby Palatnik um, when he comes for Yom Kippur. And she says, um, she says that, so Lori is the complete opposite. We'll get to her now. So she, when her and her husband are going into like a social setting, so as they're about to step in, her husband says, when are we leaving? And she's like, we didn't even get in. We don't even know if we're having a good time yet. Like, like give it a few minutes. But he's already like, when are we leaving? Because he already knows it's going to sap him of all his energy. Where for someone like Lori, who's a bracha, we're going to get to that next. It's, it gives her energy. Okay. So we have to, we have to honor the fact that there's different personalities to some people. Being with other people is like constantly depleting the, their, 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 their wallet. You know, they're just giving and giving and it's, it's draining them. And for some people, it's like oxygen. Okay. Yes. My sister is a psychiatrist in Highland Park and she, um, besides all the high, forget the Highland Park thing, you know, we're going way back just through the COVID. She is an absorber, mm. um, unbelievable, um, the energy. And she has said to me many times. <clears throat> when I've come to her, not as a sister, <clears throat> but as a um, person that needs help, you know, and she can divide herself so unbelievably. Mm. And it's very interesting, but she's an absorber and the world, you know, she'll call me and she said, I I'm, can I talk to you? Mm. I need to pick me up. Mm. Not, my, my patients are drained. She's so lucky that she has you. Thank you. I'm lucky to have her as well. Oh, but and, yes. And that's actually called an empath right? An empath is someone that absorbs all the, like they have so much empathy that they absorb it. And for people like your sister, that's, she's, you said she's a psych psychiatrist. So she needs to protect herself by putting, right? It's so hard. So hard. But she doesn't, you know, it's very interesting, but she, when you said that, I immediately thought of Cheryl. Ah, okay. Well, my, my husband, if whoever knows Gaddy, he is clearly a Chayim, right? Right, Julie, do you think? Totally, totally. Like like thinking and great ideas and in his head, I'm like, hello, you know? Well, he he does like spending time with him by himself. He's very happy to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's interesting. So, but there's well, part of his I body, part of his soul, yeah. It's possible because people don't understand this. You can be, and introvert with where it drains you mm. but with good social skills mm. Mm. So i have to explain this to people a lot of times about myself so you could, you could very once you know it you could great social skills. build it a little bit 
in my own opinion. I love to be with people, but it drains me. Yeah. It, so, it, so you have to choose your time right. and place and what you can handle right. and like, but it you know, me. you go on your terms, right. Right? right? Like, hence the trip that you're going on. You're like, right? You're like, Okay, so let's go to bracha because bracha is um, a lot of fun, right? Really bracha is a lot of fun. I'm a bracha. So bracha means blessing, as I said, and we're feelers, okay? We feel things, so we're very like emotional. We are very flexible, go with the flow, okay? This is the, the typical, the typical, I mean, it's, it's, yes? So we're going soul and then we'll do body, okay? So the soul of bracha, we connects with beauty, connects with the world, a sunset, uh, just the, we're, we're like, we get inspired. Our soul is easily inspired. Um, we're generous, we're giving, we're outgoing. We wanna take care of everyone. We're on every committee, okay? And, and the quote about bracha is, is everyone loves a bracha because bracha loves everyone. Right, like everyone, like it's so easy to get. By the way, I told you guys how I told you guys some stories about when I was dating um, and I met Gadi. But before I met Gadi, I had a few other dates, like a few shidduch dates. And every time I came back from a date, I would come to my roommate in my dormitory in Israel, and I said, I mean, I could totally marry him. I mean, he's he's fine. There was never a time that I came back and said, no, I don't like him because I actually I've never met someone that I don't like. So I literally could have buried the mailman. Okay. I'm serious. And it was a problem. But then when I what? <laughs> and and I mean when I met Gunny, I knew he was special, but I literally couldn't marry the guy before him. I just like, you know, and I needed help in in saying, well, this is important. He doesn't have this, he doesn't have that, or whatever. It was very hard because I love everyone. So that's very bracha. We're easygoing, we're flexible. Um Okay, so remember last week when I saw you and I was not wearing any lipstick or makeup, you were like, you should do that more often, okay? So brachas are actually lipstick people because we like to put ourselves together. So it's a thing. So Deborah's trying to change my nature over here. So you look equally as beautiful when you have these gorgeous little freckles and you're so fresh face. Thank you. Oh so so it's funny, like you said those words. And then as I was reading my notes from Lori's class, she literally uses that example. Like Rachas are lipstick people. Like, don't tell me not to wear lipstick. Like, don't tell me to be someone that I'm not. No, I said you look so gorgeous. Thank now. you, thank you. But but it's You're part right. of our nature. <laughs> we like putting ourselves together. Okay, so it's like a certain. It's part of our nature. Okay, so so another example about a bracha. This is a real life example. Um, when I come back from a trip, I tell my husband about the people that I met. Chaims and Tobes tell their loved ones about the places that they went to and the food that they ate and all of that stuff. I don't care about any of that. Carrie, Carrie is here. She was on my last trip to Israel. She, she's in uh, um, Silver Spring. My husband knows about you, Carrie, because Carrie, because I had a meaningful relationship with Carrie. Okay, so that's, that's right, that's brachas. We were all about people. We love people and that's what gives us energy, okay? Now that's soul. Now let's take it to body, okay? So body, so as I said, we're, we're feelers. So we're feeling in our body, which makes us come across as lazy. Because oh. yes, there's a heavy gravity that weighs us down. We love pleasures. We love comfort foods. We love snuggles and cuddles and fluffy slippers and, and all the good, like we might come across as a couch potato. Like if anyone comes to my house for coffee, I'm, I'm, I'm not like sitting up on my desk. I'm literally curled in a corner with my feet up. And, I'm, and that's how I have my, my one-on-one -on -one meetings, right? If you're coming to my house, we don't, why do we need to be so official? Let's get cozy, right? There's always a blanket right next to me, right? That's how we work. So, so the physical pleasure is very loud for brachas. We really, really enjoy it. We enjoy eating. We enjoy the beach. We enjoy the sun. We enjoy, we're excited. We're excited about everything, okay? That's brachas. Music, music, yes. Just having fun. We're like, you know, we're partying. Okay, so that's the brachas in body and in soul and in body. No, 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 no. 
<laughs> no. So this is actually, um, so Lori Palatnik does kind of bring, bring this down, but it comes from Rabbi Noah Weinberg of Blessed Memory. So he actually, and, and there are many, he has many books out there and many articles. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more, he was a masterful human being and uh, a great rabbi for the Jewish world, the founder of Aisha Torah. And oh, yeah, so, so he's recent. he's the one. Yeah. Well, I'm saying he probably this is probably like 30, 40 years ago. But it's no, 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 no. This is like a, a system of understanding people. Okay. Now let's go to Tov. Yeah, that, oh, that's right. And your son's rabbi. I mean, he was wow. his rabbi. Okay. So now let's go to Tov. Okay. Tovs are a little bit complicated. Okay. Um, because they come across as being very judgmental, because they are judgmental. Mm -hmm. but there's good judgmental and there's bad judgmental. And as Deborah said, you could take a tree once you know what it is and you could actually, once you know what your fixing is, you could work on it. Okay. So let's go to soul and body for Tov. So Tov, Tov means good. Tov are the doers. Okay. And Tovs are naturally motivated to do the right thing. So for example, I'm going to ask you guys a question, okay? And answer it to yourself and you'll know if you're a tov. If you are driving at night and it's 3 a.m. in the morning and there's not a person in sight, you're like on a farm in, I don't know, I Iowa. And you come to a red light in the middle of a small little town. Like there's no one there. Red light. Are you going to keep driving? No. No. Yeah. Is anyone here going to keep driving? You might. Okay, so a toe would never break a rule. Okay, that's how you know. If you're if you're the one to say, no, I would never, but there's no cameras, there's no people, you're just gonna sit at a long light? Seriously, would you? You might, okay? But for the toes, there were some people like Elaine, you were like, absolutely not. There's no way you would break, you would go through a red light, even if there were no... Yes. Oh, meaning if you're so it's interesting, you know, in South Africa, very different security situation. And I've been to South Africa seven times. I married a South African. So even if it's not late at night, if you are stopped at a red light and there's no one there, you're actually supposed to go. Because if you stay, you'll get hijacked. Oh, oh, exactly. Your car will be hijacked. You'll be like gun to your head. I mean, it's crazy there. So the law is that you just go. If it's safe, you go. Okay. But in a regular place, you're in like, you know, rural, like who knows, like, I don't know, Iowa or whatever. Like there's no one there. There's no lights. There's no nothing. If you answer the question that you would never go, like Elaine was like, absolutely not. You're a toad. Okay. So let's talk about this. Yes, Deborah. Well, can I ask, does it also have to do with like about fairness? Like, I think to myself, this is such a crazy question, but I think about this all the time. Like, I'm a major football fan, mm -hmm. major. Mm -hmm. And whenever I watch football, Bears fan, if the other team, there's a bad call, I'm always like, that's so unfair to them, even mm -hmm. though it helps my team. Okay. I get so very I upset. think so. You, you need to think you're going to, let me tell you a little bit more and just listen and hear, okay. hear what, what I'm saying. Okay. Because toes see things as either right or wrong. Right. There's no gray area. Right. Okay. So toves are they're, they're always doing the right thing at the right, right moment. Right. So it's it's very like, and and that's why they're judgmental. Because if someone is not if they're dealing with a bracha that's like I don't know, like it may be like they're like no that's wrong right. right? So it's it depends how you how you want to you know okay. so. Okay, so toves. So tov souls want to do the right thing. Okay, that's how they work. They like rules. They love rules. Mm -hmm. Rules are meaningful to them. Okay. And that's why many toves become observant Jews. Okay. So like if you look at who Balchuba are, I don't know what Katie is like, but they thrive with rules. Think about it. How do you how how, how does somebody that's an easygoing, it's all good. Like it's interesting. I mean, it, it's interesting to to kind of look at at Bali Chuba. I was who was I just thinking about yesterday? Um, where was I yesterday? I can't. I was here. No, I can't remember. I met with someone and she was so. Oh, on Shabbat, 
on Shabbat, we had a family that came to us mm -hmm. from Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a momentum lady, actually Carrie, Carrie, there was someone that came to my house, Carrie, I want Carrie to come visit us. But there was someone that came from from our trip in July, she called me up cold call, I have to I have to be in Deerfield, and um, my sister is observing, but she's her and her son stay by you. Okay, mm -hmm. so great, they came, whatever. And I'm talking to her, she just became observant over the last couple of years, not the momentum lady, her sister, okay? So they were here, whoever was here on Shabbat, lovely, lovely people, but she is a toad. She's actually probably a double toad <laughs> because, and, and Lori says that doubles are trouble, right? When you, when you have the same in your body and your soul, you usually don't. You usually have one, and like one of one, another one of another, which makes it a little bit more balanced, but doubles are trouble. And I think she was a double toad because even our conversation at the table about open things of like, oh, what do you think about what the Torah portion says? She was like, well, actually, I don't see it like that. And she saw it very clearly in a way that made so much sense to her. But I didn't see it like that because I'm like, maybe that's a nice idea, but maybe it means this. Like, I'm like, I'm like, keep your possibilities open, sister. But she was, even until I dropped her off, I didn't take her to the airport, but I dropped her off at her family on Sunday morning. She was still talking about the Torah portion about what I said in our partial class because she disagreed with our perspective. Something like that. It's okay. I mean, that's Judaism. It's like two Jews, three opinions. I, I welcome debate. But what was so interesting was how clear it was to her where in my mind, I think everything is open for debate. I actually believe, you know, the Torah says that when you have, there's 70 facets to the Torah, Shivim Panim La Torah. There's 70 ways of really understanding and delving into something. It's not one way, but for a tov, there's one right and there's one wrong. That's it. Okay. So they love Jewish law. Because Jewish law, halacha, right? Halacha, which means law, Jewish law, actually means like halach means to walk. It means the way. So there's one way according to Jewish law. So that's why Tov's love, they love that structure. Yeah. You tell me that I have to dress this, this, and this. Okay, great. Everything within that is so freeing and liberating to me. They're not struggling with anything that's outside those boundaries because they find their safe haven within it. Okay. It, does anyone here feel connected to a Tov or do you have a Tov in your life? Like, does that talk to you? <laughs> okay. okay. But there's nothing wrong with going through the light, but okay. No, 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 no. Let me let me explain a little more. Yeah, so you have one primary, one secondary, and you have a little bit of the other one. We have all of these, but if you understand your main, like what drives you, then it's, uh, I also would never go through a red light. I actually think as much as, and this is such an interesting combo, but I think I'm a bracha tov, right? And which is, because I do like structure. Even though I'm so unstructured in my in my soul, I'm all over the place. In my body, I do have structure. So going into the body of Tov, okay, what we know about the body, very busy. We like organization. We like color coding things. Okay, yes, I think you oh, no, like I that. I, I think you have a lot of this in you. Okay, like our linen closets, which my is a mess right now, just because I don't have time. Linen closets spice rack, whatever, things like that. And we love scheduling ourselves out. In our bodies, we are busy, 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 and we love lists. We love checking things off. That is hope. It's almost like a little bit, like a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if it's OCD because I'm not OCD, but I was going to use the word anal, but that's not a nice word. We're like, it's a little bit type A. Yeah. It's yeah. a little bit like we like things to be just so. Julie, do you remember our first interaction a year ago when I came I came here? Oh my God. No, no, I'm talking to Julie Credit. No, no, no. When, like one of our first events here, um, we were doing a friend raiser. 
and and I, I like baked a hundred honey cakes oh, yeah. and and we had like I don't know like a whole package like a little round challah yeah, and honey yeah. sticks and whatever and, and we had people come I didn't know anyone so we're like here's a package here's a gift bag whatever so when we were and it was a lot to put together so I needed volunteers whatever so thank god Julie came and Julie was stuffing the tissue paper in Way she would stuff the tissue paper in, and I almost couldn't breathe. Yeah. I had to remember that was like, I, I mean, she's never gonna let me live it down, I think, because I was like, Julie, it was so hard for me. I'm like, I wanted it to be because we had two colors of tissue paper, so one had to be this way and one had to be tilted so that when you, you get it, so that when you put it together, you like, and then we, we like pop it out and it's so beautiful and the colors and everything. And I literally was like, you could do this. Don't say anything. You barely know her. She doesn't know you. You breathe. Right. And then eventually I couldn't take it. I was like, Julie, like I, I you're going to, and she probably thought I was insane. We had, we were making a hundred gift bags and I wanted the tissue paper to be the way that I wanted it. Okay. But that's just who I am. I'm sorry. And we don't have to be. What? Wait, I wonder if it's connected to my earbud. Yeah. 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 We needed to like establish from the very get-go yeah. that, that that I want things so and and to me Lachaim Center is my child's bar mitzvah like it really it's the same it's like like I love the people here I want it to be beautiful like it makes no difference it's not this is we're all it's all equal so that's that was, I, that was an interesting way of, of of acknowledging so now we get it we yeah. can understand that there are different ways that our body reacts and different ways that our soul reacts and once we could understand it and grasp it, A, we could respect ourselves, stop being so apologetic for ourselves. And B, we could really understand the people around us, that they're not like us. They don't think like us, right? It's, it's, you could go into like learning people's love languages or whatever. There are lots of ways of understanding people. But part of figuring out who you are is doing a little bit of this work so you understand what is my essence. We're trying to do this to Shuva. We're turning to ourselves and we're like still stuck at who am I? So it's knowing it and, and honoring it and grabbing it and then moving forward and then tweaking it because some of this is annoying. Mm -hmm. Tobes could be judgmental. So we need to work around that. We can't be so judgmental. It's not coming from a bad place. It's just coming from a place of like, you literally think they're wrong. Because you think it's black and white and you're right, so they have to be wrong. Right? Okay. I would just like person that you said you were. Yeah. So I'm so but but I don't know I've I've never fully like I've never fully I know that I'm a bracha. At first I thought I was a bracha bracha, right? Very easygoing. Because that's very I'm very, very easygoing. But there's something in Tobe that I also have, like like I do like making things happen and getting things done yeah well no no i i don't know but it's also the judgmental part everyone is judgmental yeah right um everyone has judgment judgment's a good thing so we could be discerning of, of things that we don't want to be a part of right judgment is ingrained in us so but judgment's been something that i've worked on for a long time not judging other people so yeah so that any questions Really? Right, right. Okay. Well, what do you feel more as far as like soul, like your essence? Let's not let, because the body is how it manifests. Yeah. Right. So, so I've heard Lori say it so many times and, and every time I'm like, what am I? I just know that I'm not fine. I'm not fine. Fine is the thinkers. I, I make decisions so quickly. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, no, and I'm not an intellectual thinker. Like I'm not, I'm just like, 
that's a beautiful idea. I'm an inspirer. I love being I inspired. Say, going along with your story there, I always say that COVID yeah. made everybody else catch up to my germophobia, but I don't have to make an excuse. Like when people would come to my house because I'm a big entertainer, I would like cringe, but I'd be like, when people would offer to help, I'd be like, can you please wash your hands? They'd be like, mm. I washed my hands before I left the house. And I'm like, but mm. well, you've touched this. And, mm. and they'd be like, Ugh. and now I'm like, could you please wash your hands? Everybody's like, of course. Mm. <laughs> like, no. no. Okay, so I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to close up in five minutes. I want to share a story and I want to talk a little bit about this Teshuva idea. Okay, so we have like five more minutes or so. Okay, so probably one of the most, um, I don't know, beautiful things I experienced as far as seeing someone in front of you as such a struggling, beautiful, broken soul. You know, we all we all know people, it's ourselves. Like there's nothing more beautiful than a broken vessel. We spoke about that idea of Kintsugi, the Japanese art of the broken pottery that you fill the cracks with gold and it makes it so much more valuable. So there, I'll tell you the story, story of this, um, this man and his wife. I, I feel like, I don't know if I should change their names. I mean, it, it's the most common names, in Jew, like you would never know them, Leah and Yehuda, like in the Jewish world, right? And like their last name was like Cohen. And I changed their Cohen name. It's not Cohen, but it's similar, okay? So like very, very Jewish people um, came to Portland and we were living there for seven years. We knew all the Jews. Like it was a small Jewish community. So literally like if I was in the JCC and I saw a face that I didn't recognize, I'd go over to them and say, are you new here? Are you visiting? And they'd be like, how did you know? And I'm like, cause we know everyone here. So they're like, wow. Cause there people come from big communities. They're like, how could you know everyone? I'm like, that, that's Portland. It was small, tight and cozy. So there was this Leah Yehuda Cohen, this Jewish family that were living there, right? Not, not so far down the, down the road. No one knew they were Jewish. No one knew they were, they weren't involved. They weren't coming to end, not even high holidays, nothing. And they both came from their communities. I think one was from Borough Park and one was from Muncie. And so they came from their very strong Jewish communities and both of them independently or together, I don't know what their whole journey was. They left Judaism behind. They had a negative experience and they threw everything out. So how did we meet them? So we got a call. My husband got a call. My husband's a Mohel. He got a call from their one of their parents that looked Scotty up and said, Rabbi, I'm going to ask you the biggest favor. I need you to get into the hospital. Our, ch our children, my, our, our, their son, their daughter, whoever it was I called, just had a baby boy. And they don't even want to do a bris. I want you to get in there and make sure they have kosher bris. So Gadi showed up at the hospital, found this family, and they were not interested. They said, we're not having a bris. We're not giving a Jewish name, nothing to talk about. And I don't know how Gadi managed to, to really, they were like, not interested, you know, like body language, the whole deal, like goodbye. We're not interested in anything you have to offer. And um, Gadi persisted and he ended up, they gave him the right to, to say the blessings and to maybe do the, the cut, like do the actual bris. But there was a urologist that did the whole procedure. Okay. But, but there was, it was kosher, it was Jewish, it was kosher and it was fine. And the parents, grandparents were so relieved and so grateful. Okay, so time passes, we go on with our lives, and Gadi had the contact information for this family. So he reached out, never answered his call, never took a phone call, never nothing. And one Friday, we, we did like the challah hugs that we do here, we used to do it in Portland also. So every Friday we were making challahs and Gadi was delivering them to our community people. And one Friday he knocked on their door. They wouldn't even answer the door. So he left it by the door, hot call, okay? Like left it by the door. He said, it's Rabbi Levy. They're like, we know who you are. We're not interested in your wares, you know? And I'm so rude, like, wow. So Gadi went back the next week with a challah. And again, they didn't answer the door. It took a few weeks and eventually they opened the door cracked. They let him like pass it to them. Through. Like, I don't know what they thought. 
And he kept, he kept at it. He did, I never knew who he was delivering to, but he kept going back to this Leah and Yehuda and, and bringing them a challah. And they loved the challah because that's how they grew up and it was part of their past. And it's like, you know, it's just souls. Like we all have our layers and we all have our bruises and we, they had plenty of bruises. I had no idea what they went through. Anyways, long story short, six months later, they finally, finally said they will come to our house for Friday night dinner. Okay, it's a big deal. It was the worst Friday night to show up to my house. One of my kids was kicked out of school. It was, yeah, everything hit the fad that week. I was not in a good place and all the kids were fighting. The house was a disaster. I think the cleaning lady canceled. Like it was like the worst week. Like I wanted to have this perfect meal for them. They're finally coming back for Shabbat and I could barely be present at the table. So I'm doing my thing, taking care of like this fight in the corner and like cleaning up the spill and whatever it is. And my husband's doing his thing. He's making kitu. She's, you know, this, this couple, they're sitting at the table. They're busy with their six month old baby. Like she was totally checked out. She was like totally absorbed in the baby. And Yehuda, this nice guy is sitting there on the side and I'm not even noticing him. It wasn't a show. It never is. If you've been to my house, you see, it's like what you see is what you get. We do Friday night every week. It's not a show. It's not perfect. It is what it is. It depends on the week. It depends how good the food came out. You know, it's just, and we're busy. He's giving kiddush. We're, we bless our children. My husband blesses, then I bless each child. And then I look over to my right where Yehuda is sitting. And he's sobbing. He's just sobbing. There's tears like pouring down his face. He couldn't, it was like a damn broke. And I looked at him and I said to him, Yehuda, I don't know your story and I don't know what you've been through and what pain you, you've experienced, but I'm so happy you're here with us. It didn't have, it, what, what touched him, I don't know what touched him because it was a pretty crazy week, but it wasn't the perfection and it wasn't the, the good behavior. It was the home, that it was a normal home where Judaism was central at that moment. And he missed it. He missed it because he had a soul that was thirsty for it. And it, it must have been years since he had a Friday night experience. Years and so many layers on, on, on him that they, you know, they were like, they were like, you know, completely not interested. But the soul is so much more powerful than anything else. That's the essence. When we talk about Teshuva and returning to something real. It's, it's, it's like sometimes we don't even do you think he even knew that he was going to feel something he, he wanted to be in and out he told us he's like we're going to come but we're like as soon as you know six o'clock our baby needs to go to sleep so like we're like come for whatever you want like no problem but they ended up staying longer past the baby's bedtime they're first I know and um and then they came back and they came back and they came back they came they even joined us for Passover Seder that year was really really special we're, we're still very close with this family they actually have their second child oh. Gaddy um did the circumcision i'm pretty sure i think i think it's two boys and he went back to do the second circumcision um and they're just precious jews jews on a journey like all of us it doesn't matter where we've come from it actually makes no difference right we think that our experiences dictate who we are and who we need to be it's not true. We're writing our own story, right? Wherever we are, it's never too late. It's never, we're never too far. We're, we have the same, the soul is so, so strong. And as I've mentioned before to like Barry and to the last group that came back when we landed in Israel, right? And I probably shared this with you guys so many times. So it was like, it totally like just made me tear up and get choked up. It was, we landed in Israel and I got a text message from one of the ladies on our trip, um, Lisa Azuri. And she did, and it was so simple what she wrote. She wrote, I just landed in Israel and I don't, I don't know why, but I'm crying. And, and what I, and I sat there, like, I really, to me, that is the strength of the soul that no matter where you've been or what your journey has been, your soul is so strong. It will prevail. It could get through so much darkness because the soul is like, it's like a pilot light. It never goes out right? It's always there. Sometimes it's a small flame and sometimes we like inspire it and it's a big, large flame as a bonfire, but it's always going to be there. Our job is to always find ways of keeping it inspired. 
And I think I'm going to end here because I did go over time, but maybe next week we'll speak a little bit about inspiration because inspiration is not steady. It's not like rain. It's like lightning. It comes in bolts. And that bolt of inspiration gives you clarity, just like lightning, like lightning lights up the night, right? And you see for one second, oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm going to, you know, switch gears. I'm going to go now here because I saw for a second, but then it gets dark again, right? But that bolt of inspiration is what we need to hold on to. It at least gets us to the next time that we could re, re-spark ourselves up, get re-inspired. So that's also very, very important to know on this journey. So lots of concepts. We didn't get to Tushuba, but we'll do that next week, hopefully. And Yes. I love it. I love it. Hold on one second. I'm just going to close this. Let me just close this. Hi, guys.